All right, hello everybody. I hope we're coming across. To, uh, I hope I'm live. I can't remember if I'm doing this right every week or not. But uh, nice to see you all. Uh, I'm glad to have an opportunity to do a show here on Real Liberty Media. And I have a bunch of stuff to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to be reading some stuff, and I kind of wanted to give you guys a heads up. <laughs> I have a cataract in my left eye, so sometimes things are a little bit cloudy. But, uh, oh, good. Okay, I'm going to turn my mic down. Thanks for the feedback on that. Let's see, how is that? Any better? I'll look for some feedback uh, here. Uh, I know I had been kind of weak in the past. I had some comments, feedback on some shows, and um, people said it was a little bit soft, so I turned it up. Oh, we're going to turn it down some more. Um, I'll just go ahead and we'll see if we can't fix that as we go along here. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is kind of funny. Uh, about, you know, before this whole COVID thing started, I remember parents coming into my office and telling me about how great their uh, <laughs> their kids, <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me, sorry about that, about how great their kids do with devices. You know, like they would say, oh, if I need anything done on my cell phone, <laughs> yeah, Corona cough, no kidding. Um they say, if I need anything done with my cell phone, you know, I just have my kids do it for me because they know so much or they can show me how to do this, that, or the other thing. And um, I, I kind of, the you know, in the past, what, month, two months, and I don't want to make light of children not being in school at all. I think it's devastating some of the things that the kids are going through these days. And I definitely respect that, you know, I think socialization is a good thing. I think them getting out and being amongst their friends is a good thing and participating in sports or activities or not is a good thing. But this being at home, being isolated for so long has really kind of gone on way too far. But my point is, it's kind of funny that what I've heard mostly now is how these kids can't deal with these devices and I just think it's a little bit ironic that, you know, 14 months ago, they were whizzes at all these devices. You know, they had it all figured out. Like, um, you know, they could, you know, show you how to get text, send text, you know, get on some or install applications and use them. And now all of a sudden, because they have to do it at home, it's like uh, not, you know, I don't know. It's like suddenly COVID has wiped out their ability to function with these devices and you hear a lot of complaints about them also and also something else that came up I was thinking about is uh, I, I have grandchildren and they've actually been staying with us for uh, well just over a week now and it's been awesome I mean it's really been fun we've had five grandkids here on and off we're sharing them with the other grandparents because their parents, the kids' parents, our daughter and son-in-law, went off to uh, hike the Grand Canyon, which is pretty cool. So um, we've been taking care of the grandkids, splitting that duty with the other grandparents, and it's been pretty awesome. But one of them was telling me, she's like, um, she must be 15. One of them was telling me that she... And, of course, she is just stuck on that device 24-7, it seems like. And she was saying that uh, when she is, when she goes to bed at night, she goes to bed at 10 o'clock, and she said she just lays there and can't go to sleep for a couple hours. And I was thinking to myself, man, that thing about blue light in your face, the, the ra you know, not radiation. I guess it is some a, a form of radiation from devices uh they say it really kind of messes up your ability to sleep. So uh, I'm going to do, uh, I think in a week or two, I'm going to I'm going to have a little uh, segment on that blue light and how it affects your uh, brain and ability to go to sleep. I had promised in the past I was going to be talking about um, food preparation or 
ways to get a hold of food and one of the things uh, one of my favorite little gardens is this garden called the three sisters garden and I wanted to cover that a little bit today before I get really carried away because I have a lot of stuff on my plate here and I do want to kind of keep uh, maybe keep people thinking about ways they can make money make food or raise their own food or obtain food and I've had people in another chat room uh, I was noticing that uh, somebody said well I have a gun I'll be able to get all the food I want and you may think that that's true and maybe where you live that might be true but I can tell you um, like in the area I live which is kind of out in the kind of out in the boonies kind of out in the country we have wildlife here I don't know if I've posted uh, I haven't posted pictures of wildlife on my blog I guess I could do that probably somebody will let me know if I can or can't do that but um, I could include a picture or two on the blog and you could see I had um, I think I was talking about the raccoons that were in the hole in the north pasture and the owl that came down and took them and I got that on the game camera and um, Anyway, so I live out here in the country, and there's deer and bobcats, cougars, uh, bear. Uh, you know, there's wildlife around. And, you know, there's food to eat if you had to eat. But just think about this. Probably a lot of other people are going to have the same idea you have when it comes to, um, let's say, hyperinflation, no food in the markets, uh, you know, in a in in the, the unavailability of food for whatever reasons, either it's too expensive, or there just isn't any. I mean, look at what happened when this whole lockdown started a year ago. Uh, stuff flew off the shelves in the stores, and stores only have about a four-day supply of of um, stock anyway so you know when something happens it's going to disappear like crazy so my hope is that by sharing some ideas that I've used in the past people might be able to put them put those ideas to work in their own lives so this three sisters garden is really kind of interesting and it's been around a long time my blog will have a little uh, segment about the history of the Three Sisters Garden. Um, basically, it is uh, corn, beans, and squash. And it almost doesn't matter what varieties you use to build this little garden. I've done it, uh, I've done it a couple times, and it's, it's pretty cool. It's not going to feed a family for an entire year or anything like that, but it kind of depends. Like you could make this a uh, pretty, a pretty uh, large operation, but I'm going to describe pretty much the smallest, almost smallest operation that you could make it because I'm trying to give people ideas of what they can do in a small space if they had to. So this is how you do a three, it's called the Three Sisters Garden. It's composed of corn, beans, and squash. So you plant your corn first, and you let it get a couple inches high. Oh, I should start out by saying the best way to plant this is in a little mound. And what I would do is make a mound of dirt about um, maybe four to six feet across or in diameter and just a few inches high in the center you know and tapering out just like any old mound and and i'm also not going to be real technical about this because you know plants will grow if you give them sunlight and water they'll grow so don't let the you know don't get stuck in the details but try and catch the general idea here so let's um let's I like to do three stalks of corn, but let's just do one stalk of corn in the center of that mound. 
if you did three, you know, space them kind of equally apart. You all know what corn looks like when it grows. You want to give it a little bit of room to leaf out, but uh, but you can kind of keep it sort of close together. So you plant your corn first. You let it grow a few inches tall. Um, you know, make sure it's come out of the ground and starting to put on some height, maybe four to six inches tall, really, not much more than that. Then you plant some beans in the same mound right around the corn stalks. And I don't mean right around like one inch away, but, you know, a, like a hand distance away from the corn stalk. Plant beans around basically each corn stalk. And if you get the the climbing variety of beans is best, and that's what the whole idea of this garden is. So... Uh, you plant the beans and you let them come out of the ground and let them, you know, when they start getting those little uh, tendricles that are reaching out to grab onto something to climb, they will grab onto the corn stalks, which have now grown another probably week or so. Um, because, number one, you planted them first. You waited maybe a week or so to plant your beans and the corn's going to continue to grow. So those little tendrils of the pole beans will be looking, uh, you know, stretching out, looking for something to grab onto and climb, and they will grab onto the corn. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the beans actually fix um, nitrogen in the soil, which is a great fertilizer. If you've ever had to go buy fertilizer, you know that one of the numbers on the fertilizer is nitrogen. So if you have a plant that actually, you know, brings nitrogen into the ground, it's, uh, well, it's beneficial because you don't have to add any fertilizer. You're getting some nitrogen for free from your beans that you planted. So the beans will reach out and grab onto the corn. The corn's going to continue to grow up, which will, you know, stretch the beans out. Um, the Another benefit of the beans being attached to the corn is when you get those wild weather days with a lot of wind, um, the beans actually provide a little support to the corn stalk because you've surrounded the corn stalk with beans. And they're going to kind of tether that corn a little bit for you and give you a little extra uh, protection against having your corn stalks knocked over by high wind or hail or whatever kind of weather you may experience during the growing season. And then the last thing you're going to do is you're going to plant some squash. And you can do summer squash or winter squash, either one. I think um, you could actually do both, which would be kind of handy because you would be able to eat the summer squash you know, as soon as it's ripe, and you could actually put the winter squash in a like a root cellar, and it'll keep for a it'll keep for quite a while. So the purpose of the squash is, you know, squash when it grows produces these big, beautiful leaves, and those leaves shade the ground and actually help. Uh, hold moisture into the ground. So when you do water, um, you won't have to water a lot because you should be able to keep that soil pretty moist and keep it from drying out because of the shade leaves from the squash. And that is the Three Sisters Garden. The other great thing about this garden is, um, uh, I'm going to read this. It says, these three crops are also the center of culinary traditions and complement one another well. A diet of corn, beans, and squash is complete and balanced. Corn provides carbohydrates and the dried beans are rich in protein and have amino acids absent from the corn. Squash provides different vitamins and minerals than corn and beans. These three crops are also important because they can all be dried and used for food year round. So that's kind of cool. I mean, you know, like I said, doing one mound is going to produce a bit of food, but uh, you could, 
you know, in times when we're not facing, you know, hyperinflation, you know, you could just eat that fresh. But if you want to put some stuff away, you have, you know, now you've grown all this food that you could put away for, uh, well, when you need it. So anyway, that along with, um, well, that's the Three Sisters Garden. It's very simple, pretty easy to do. It's kind of fun too if you get uh, if you get your kids interested in gardening at all or growing food or you know self sufficiency. It's a pretty good little uh, experiment to put that together and let them have at it and watch it grow because those things, um, those three things are actually pretty fun to watch grow so uh give it a give it a try anyway that's my so 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 far on this uh on my little show here uh hey by the way this is doc mike the redneck dentist i should have said that when i first came on but i was kind of confused starting up all the stuff i know it probably doesn't seem like a lot of stuff to you veterans of um podcasting and streaming here but um for me it's kind of it's all new. Anyway, Doc Mike, the redneck dentist here. And so on my show before, I talked about sprouts. And of course, you all know, if you've listened to the shows in the past, I love sprouting because it is the simplest, quickest way to get nutrition. Because those little sprouts provide the same nutrition that the adult plant provides and you can get it you can get that nutrition in a week, which is awesome. Uh, you don't have to wait a whole growing season to get it. So um, that's it for the uh, food segment of the week. Oh, my stupid phone. Yep, got to turn that down. I don't want that making noise anymore. Sorry about that. My, The next thing I wanted to talk about, I know, I don't know if you guys heard Biden's address or if you're just aware of some of the things he said but um, I was so offended by listening to it and I actually wanted to listen to it now I didn't listen I don't think I ever really sat down and listened to one single one of Trump's addresses but I was just dying to see Biden's address because I, I figured he was going to be a fumbling idiot a bumbling idiot, but he sort of was, and he wasn't nearly as bad as I thought he was going to be as far as his mental uh, acuity, but I was so offended when he said that, you know, maybe by Independence Day, we would be able to gather in small groups, but what really irritated me is when he said and, you know, once everybody is vaccinated or once you got back, get vaccinated, we'll tell you what you can and cannot do. And it just so happens that he mentioned that about the same time that he mentioned that by Independence Day, we may be able to gather in small groups. And what I'm doing now is I'm start, I and I know that I'm going to get, uh, silenced on many social media platforms but I'm calling for everybody just to claim independence on Independence Day I say you know it's we, we've gone far too long in this lockdown um, playing by who who who's ever rules um, made the you whoever made these rules to put us in the chains that we're in today and uh, I think Independence Day would be a perfect day for some, you know, uh, social disobedience, civil disobedience, I guess, and just say, hey, we're not doing this anymore, man. If I could get, if I could get businesses to uh, agree to open up and drop all these stupid, freaking rules or not obey the governor's um, desires. And we all just go do whatever, you know, go shopping, go eat, go barbecue, go patronize our favorite places. No masks, <laughs> no whatever, you know, no social distancing. And I'm not saying I'm not. I guess I am kind of saying be reckless, but I don't believe it's reckless. 
You know, the things I've been seeing, so many people actually survive this virus that, um, you know, we've, we've way overreached as far as um, what we're doing to control it. And, you know, looking at the states who never did actually participate, or I guess they did participate in the so-called lockdowns, but then they got out of it, you know, much earlier than some of the rest of us. I mean, or here in Oregon, forget it. We're going to be, the governor's going to claim this as as long as she can, for as long as she can, she's going to keep uh, keep the screws tightening on us. Um, but I would sure like to see, I would sure like to see the country, okay, well, half the country, uh, I'd love to see the whole country get on board, but you know, it just seems like uh, we're so divided all the time that <laughs> no matter how much sense it makes, some people just are not going to do it. Although, you know, you kind of see now, it seems like a lot of uh, the other side or the Democratic side, I guess, uh, they're getting to be kind of fed up with it, too, which is awesome because, uh, you know, if we could get a lot of people on both sides just to say, hey, screw you guys, we're not doing this anymore, and what are you going to do about it? I know there's not enough room to lock us all up, and I seriously doubt they're going to try and lock everybody up. I mean, hell, here in Portland, I mean, I'm not in Portland, thank God. Portland's 65 miles from me. 63 probably miles from me um they are uh they're still rioting we had riots last night or um yeah last night as a matter of fact and the night before last they had riots and they had burning and they were saying uh they were saying stuff about biden and uh you know different presidents same old imperialism so it's kind of interesting that um just because the administration changed really nothing changed as far as portland is concerned so of course we have this kind of complete idiot mayor in portland who is spineless to say the least he's uh anyway yeah i don't know what he is but i guess he was smart enough to get elected but man beyond that um i don't really i can't really say much I have to get a drink here. All right. I wonder what people who do this like for a living, how how do they do that? They must go to a commercial or play something so that they can uh, get a little drink <laughs> or something. Um, I, man, I have a lot of stuff about the, the, the virus. Um, this week, but uh, one of the things I was thinking about, and I actually have a couple of stories to go along with this, is uh, I think the week before last they were talking about, and I guess you hear all the time now about how long it's going to be before, you know, uh, uh, before, I guess if you want to call it herd immunity, oh yeah, cough button, button, that's true, actually, and I do have something like that, I can tap my mic and <laughs> just mute it. And then you guys can listen to, not, to nothing, but um, uh, I guess it'd be better than listening to me drink or cough, either one. Anyway, uh, so, you know, this whole herd immunity thing and having so many people get the shot and be, you know, supposedly treated to not react to COVID, uh, you know, is a thing. And I think it's a thing because that's what's going to make some of these dictators decide when they're going to allow us to go through life in a somewhat normal manner. But here's the problem. There is a ton of people who are just not going to play. They're just not interested in getting the vaccine or the shot, let's say because there's some a lot of discussion about whether or not it is a true vaccine or not. So, so far, I'm, I'm just going to roll down to the story. Uh, oh, man. Man, I have a ton of notes, like a lot of notes. 
um, the, the main point here is that, oh yeah, here it is. Okay, so guess who the, who the, uh, the largest group of people who don't want to get the vaccine are? <laughs> it's the frontline workers. It says the biggest COVID-19 vaccine skeptics are frontline healthcare workers. Um, it says, what do frontline healthcare workers and first responders know about COVID-19 COVID vaccines that politicians and their public health advisors don't? And then it goes on to state all these studies from uh, different, number one, different places in some states, different states, and different countries, how much, um, how much, uh, um, pushback they're getting on people getting these vaccines. But I got to tell you, those people who are working in those positions must know something that, you know, the rest of us don't know or we're not being told. Um, because uh, I'm going to just read some of these. So 51% of healthcare workers and first responders polled in December were unconvinced of the merits of getting vaccinated, even if the vaccine was free available, FDA approved, and 90% effective. Um, let's see what else. Let's, let's see who was uh, there. Um, let me see who this is. The professionals. Uh, Gallup found these results especially concerning since those at highest risk of exposure to COVID-19, the professionals required to meet America's health, safety, and critical economic needs, whom the National Academies of Engineering, Science, and Medicine define as Tier A, uh, 1A workers, were the likeliest to refuse vaccination, 34%. 20% um, to 40% in L.A. County, they surveyed different places there, um, refused to participate in the vaccine. In Georgia, according to an estimate an estimate in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, only 30% of healthcare workers have been inoculated. In Ohio, 60% uh, of nursing home workers refuse the vaccine. In Texas, uh, reported in February, um, that their uh, home health and assisted living agencies have refused the vaccine, um, and it just goes on and on. And it, I noticed that uh, even, uh, I forget which uh, country, I think India was also listed as a country when they started offering the vaccine as like people just are not willing to get it. Um, oh yeah, Indi India started admi administering the second vaccine dose two weeks ago Half of the frontline workers and nearly 40% of healthcare workers have not shown up. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, and it says here for healthcare workers around the world, their dilemma is who to believe their government employers and the pharmaceutical companies who insist the vaccines, air quotes, benefits far outweigh the risks or their own eyes. And I got to tell you, you know, I think they know something we don't know. They're seeing, you know, they're seeing a lot of stuff that we're not seeing. I noticed uh, also there was, um, let's see, when was this? This was March 6th. The latest report from the CDC was, and this is, you know, from the CDC. So I don't know how much you can take this for. Um, I don't know. You have to take it at face value. It's coming from the CDC. Same, you know. But, you know, federal government numbers, they say there was, there's been 1,637 deaths following the COVID-19 shot. So, uh, and I think one of those things was whether or not that was a higher number or a, a higher incidence or lower incidence than with uh, the flu virus. And anyway, it kind of goes on to talk about all those numbers and, you know, how many of them, um, how many people, you know, what percent of people died, what their ages were, you know, and if there were any, it doesn't really talk about if they had extenuating circumstances or not. I'm sure there's going to be more to uh, 
more to that. I can tell you this. I bet you, <laughs> I'll bet you, you know, I've heard, I even heard a, some story last night. A guy on a, was killed in Florida in a motorcycle accident. His, he was decapitated and he called and they, they said his death was caused by COVID. But I can bet you, you're not going to see that same kind of extension of COVID death to, you know, getting the jab and dying. I'm sure they're going to try and um, brush away any of these deaths that they can rule out or say, well, it wasn't caused by the vaccine, very much unlike they were doing with the with the virus itself and attributing like every single death to COVID. I mean, it was ridiculous. I even had some some examples here in Oregon. Um, not direct knowledge, but one person removed knowledge of people dying of something else and it being called a COVID death. Hang on. Okay. All right. We're going to take a little break from uh, the COVID thing for just a minute because uh, I do want to tell some stories about my life as a dentist also because, I mean, some stuff is kind of interesting and it's kind of, I've had, I can't tell you just how fortunate I have been in my career. I don't know what I did to deserve having the career I've had and living the life I've lived, but I'm telling you, I have had such a fantastic life and great career, and I've really had some things happen along the way that were just amazing. And I'll start off with a, I'm going to tell you a story about a federal, a federal inmate that I had kind of the pleasure of being involved with his treatment, and you'll understand why when I'm done with it, but the purpose of me telling you this story is to kind of give you a little insight into where my career started. So when you go to dental school, I mean, you learn how to do dentistry, but you don't really do dentistry and start, like your massive learning curve starts when you get out of dental school and actually get out in the real world. Well, the amazing thing for me was because I had been I had been in the uniform service for oh eight years by then. Well actually no, let's see it's four, eight, twelve. Yeah, twelve years by the time I graduated from dental school. Um I wanted to continue that career so that I could so that I could get a retirement I mean I wanted a retirement that was one thing that I I wanted benefits and I wanted retirement because I already had 12 years invested I figured if I did another you know 8 to 16 years I would I would have a pretty good retirement so when I graduated from dental school, I accepted a commission with the U.S. Public Health Service, which is a uniform services of the United States. It has the same benefits of any of the military branches. It carried on my, you know, my longevity in the service, with uniform service branches. So it was all cool. I was getting pretty good pay for, you know, my my rank at the time. Although it's kind of laughable. To think about what I was getting paid uh, as a dentist but see my purpose wasn't to make money at that time it was to get a um, retirement so I was accepted in the US Public Health Service I took a commission as a lieutenant and I went to work my first assignment was at the federal prison it's actually called the Federal Medical Center in Rochester Minnesota and of course, those of you who are familiar with Rochester, Minnesota, know that the other big medical facility there is the Mayo Clinic. Now, it just so happens that the Department of Justice put this medical center in Rochester, Minnesota to be close to the Mayo Clinic. And I think 
they probably were thinking, you know, maybe we could work with the Mayo Clinic for, you know, in some capacity. And it actually turned out to be at the time, which was 1989, it was a great relationship. So this is how things work. Like if you were a federal inmate and you had to, now let me go back here a second. So the Federal Medical Center was a complete medical center. We actually had uh, inpatient rooms, two floors of inpatient rooms. We actually had operating rooms and uh, it was fully staffed, fully operational medical center. So when, uh, whenever we had, you know, and of course being, now this is what's kind of amazing. So being the, a dentist, in that medical center, we participated in all of the uh, all of the care. No matter what it was, we participated in all of the care of all of the inmates. By that, I mean we didn't like do heart surgery stuff like that. But you know, the doctors who were in charge of those cases always consulted with us. We always kind of knew who was doing what as far as patient treatment goes, you know, what we needed to do as dentists to get them ready or be able to, you know, function well or whatever. So I'll probably go into that a lot later. But the other side of that whole coin is so that if inmates had stuff that needed to be done that we couldn't do, we would send them to the Mayo Clinic and the Mayo Clinic would do their work. So anyway, as things go, Sometimes inmates needed um, oral surgeons to help them out. So we would coordinate their care with the oral surgeons at the Mayo Clinic, and we would work pretty much directly with those oral surgeons. In fact, most of the stuff the oral surgeons did, they could do inside the facility, so we didn't have to send patients down to Mayo Clinic. They, the, the patients just stayed in the Federal Medical Center, and the Doctors from Mayo Clinic came over and provided care there uh, inside. So I, the purpose I kind of laid out that little background is because I want to tell you this story about this lawyer, and it was probably it was probably some kind of important case <laughs> back in the late 80s, and I don't remember his name, which is good because we have HIPAA laws that we have to protect you know patients for. But uh, so this guy had done a crime, a pretty significant crime, and he had been through trial and he was supposed to be surrendering and going to prison. But instead, he decided to shoot himself in the head. Now, a lot of you already know this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. When you put a handgun in your mouth and point it up is not the right way to kill yourself as you'll soon find out because the, there's like this muzzle blast of air that comes out before the bullet and that muzzle blast kind of pushes your head back a little bit and a lot of times people don't succeed at killing themselves by shooting themselves that way and that happens to be the case with this particular person it was kind of sad too because he, he was probably 70 or something like that and you know attempted this suicide and it failed because what he ended up doing was he blew a hole right through the roof of his mouth uh, the bullet passed right through his optic nerve which fed both of his eyes and out the top of his head and it did not kill him. Yeah, he was in pretty bad shape. And of course, that happened long before he got to this facility. But that's the reason he came to this facility in Rochester, Minnesota when I was there in 1989. Anyway, so he, he was blinded by that. And he had this giant hole in the roof of his mouth. And you all know, probably that your sinuses are right above the roof of your mouth. At least some of your sinuses are right there. And when you have a hole that goes from your nose to your mouth, 
you can't, well, it's very difficult to eat. It's very difficult to drink. You can't suck on a straw, for example, or a cigarette or a bottle because when you try and suck, like close your lips and pull air through a straw, the air just goes right through your nose and through the hole that's in the roof of your mouth. So, so this guy had been on probably, you know, some feeding mechanism uh, for some time. You know, he'd already been sentenced, so he didn't have to go back to court or anything like that. So he was there at the Federal Medical Center serving out his time and hopefully getting some care. So in 89, it probably wasn't real common to do something like uh, this thing called uh, transzygomatic implants, which are really long implants that go through your zygoma, which is a kind of a bone part of your, kind of part of your cheekbone. Anyway, um, anyway, so we had to figure out a way to help this guy. Now the wound in the roof of his mouth had healed kind of perfectly. So, you know, it was just a nice round and I'm sure that the surgeons who saw him at the time that he was in like an emergency situation I'm sure that they did some kind of cleaning up of the bone and making the edges of that smooth and all that stuff. Anyway, this guy had kind of a perfect round circle opening in his palate. So the male clinic oral surgeons, they did, you know, some uh, some um, diagnoses, you know, to, you know, and kind of reviewed his images, probably did 3D imaging even back then to see what they would be able to do to put that guy back together or give him uh, an ability to at least eat something and drink things. And what we came up with as kind of a temporary fix was uh, we working with the Mayo Clinic oral surgeons, we constructed a denture for this guy that fit over his arch, you know, which he had no teeth left because, well, number one, he blew some of them out, and number two, because he was blind and he wasn't doing real well, he didn't take care of the other teeth he had, and they failed and were taken out somewhere along the way. So anyway, he was basically had no teeth on the top, he had this hole in his palate, and he couldn't eat because, you know, food would get up in there in that hole, or you know, trying to drink fluids, fluids would get up in there. And I don't know if you've ever had water in your nose or Coke or coffee or whatever else. It's it's not real fun. <laughs> so it's pretty difficult to function like that. But anyway, so we made him a denture. And at the time, it was kind of wild because, you know, I mean, things have come so far since then. You know, the guy probably could have got a couple implants, maybe four to six implants and snap a denture in and, you know, kind of plug that hole some other way. But what we did at the time, we made a denture. We took an impression of him and we made sure some of the impression material actually went into that hole. And we constructed a denture that had a certain kind of material that would go in that hole and actually what would happen is he would press that denture in. There was a little bit of resistance because we made the, the plug part a little bit bigger than the hole. And it wasn't the hard denture material that probably all of you have seen at one time or another before. It was, it was a spongier material. And so when he pushed the denture in, it actually kind of just like, once it got past that resistance, the denture kind of sucked up in there and stayed in. We just used the hole as kind of a mechanical retention for the denture. And it was really kind of cool because, um, you know, the guy was still blind, but he had uh, something that plugged the hole in the roof of his mouth. 
and it allowed him to be able to eat and drink, and stuff didn't get past that hole, which was cool. Uh, and actually, it kind of helped hold the denture in, which um, I don't know how many of you might, may have been or, ha you know, have dentures, but you know, maybe have known people who have had dentures. They sometimes suck. Sometimes they don't stay in very well. Uppers usually stay in much better than lowers, but um, uppers even sometimes won't stay in. And especially in this guy, an upper wouldn't have stayed in if we made it traditionally because... When you put a denture in, if it's fit just right, you actually kind of press it against your tissues and it actually creates a little suction so that it can't come out. Now it's easy to dislodge it, sure, but you, but you can actually use that suction to hold a denture in. But this guy, because he had a hole in his palate, he never would have developed a suction because he had a hole in his palate and his nose would have let air in and the denture would have constantly fallen, fallen down. So anyway, my point being, <laughs> like I was not a rock star in dental school. You know, I wasn't first and I wasn't last. I was in the middle of the pack like everybody else. But man, after dental school, I spent two years. I, I spent from eight, 89 to 91 there at the Federal Medical Center in Rochester, Minnesota, and I got so much flipping education from working with those Mayo Clinic oral surgeons. And they actually got to the point where they uh, allowed me to join them on their grand, uh, grand rounds at Mayo Clinic with other patients, just their normal patients. I had to get up early, man, because I had to be there at 4.30 in the morning because, uh, because that's the way it was at Mayo Clinic. If you were an intern, which I wasn't, but when they did their grand grand rounds, that's when they did them, is at 4.30 you would meet and you would go over all the cases and then, you know, I would get done with that and I'd go to my regular job at the prison. But I'm telling you, I just gained so much education in those two years. It really kind of kicked off the rest of my career as far, far as... Uh, uh, allowing me to have success in certain areas of the dentistry that I practice, which is general dentistry. But uh, I just wanted to kind of share that story because I am Doc Mike, the redneck dentist, and I want to make sure you guys know I actually did dentistry before. <laughs> anyway, so I have a treat for you. Hopefully this is going to work. Gosh, I'm going to watch for a minute to make sure there's not a tremendous feedback and actually I don't know if this is going to work but if it works great if it doesn't I'll just keep going
Come on over to join Real Liberty Media. See you there. Thanks. I hope you guys enjoyed that. It's my first little experience with putting together a little, uh, oh, a dual track thing. <laughs> anyway, it was kind of fun to learn that. All right, back to the serious stuff. What, 10 minutes? No, there's no way. Hey, um, I wanted to talk about a little bit about uh, some stuff going on at the border because because one thing is Oregon is doing something that is so I I can't tell you how confusing it is to live in this state so for years and years I've been taught that you know you don't abuse women that pornography is degrading to women that prostitution women are just held in bondage that they're serving some male against their will because they can't do anything else or they've been, you know, uh, forced into that lifestyle and that, you know, we need to, you know, respect women and all that stuff. So here's the problem. Like Oregon, one of the most liberal states in the country has always put, you know, women's rights where they should be first. 
make, trying to make everybody equal, all that stuff, until now. And this state is run by Democrats. It is, it, there's no possible way Oregon, for the foreseeable future, is going to be anything but Democratic. Even the Republicans in this state are disgusting as far as their politics go. Um, they're really, truly rhinos, Republicans in name only. So this is what Oregon has decided to do. They decided it would be a good idea to make prostitution and pimping legal in this state. So what's confusing to me is, okay, for decades now, I was born and raised in Oregon. I'm a true Oregonian, honestly, I am, or I would have left a long time ago. This state is a beautiful state. I mean, we have desert, we have mountains, we have coastal mountains, we have ocean, we have rivers, we have every imaginable geography that you can think of we have here in Oregon. It is a beautiful state to live in. It is absolutely, probably the worst state politically to live in. So I don't understand now how the party who screams that, you know, we're doing this for the children or that we want to protect women's rights and we want women to have the same opportunities as everybody, blah, all, on and on and on. How can they turn around the exact same party who has upheld women for so long, turn around and say, well, but we want to make prostitution and pimping legal. I mean, all of a sudden, did that become a respectable career or now somehow it's not degrading to women to be, you know, prostitutes and to be, I guess, owned or operated by a pimp? I mean, come on. The hypocrisy is ridiculous. Like, you, nobody could possibly explain to me how this makes sense, how you, how you can justify doing that. But it does kind of make me remember that in places where hyperinflation came, where everybody knew that hyperinflation was coming, one of the things they did was legalize pretty much every imaginable drug you could think of, which Oregon has done recently, and I think Washington has done that also. And by legalizing it, I'll tell you what the law is, although I don't have the specifics, but basically, no matter what amount of personal use drugs you are found with, you get a hundred dollar fine and I think you can watch like some kind of recovery or addiction like webinar and get the charge erased from your record. That was just passed this year. And then if you add on top of that, that the, uh, oh, the rioters that burned businesses and broke windows and stole things from businesses None of those people, I won't say none of those people, I don't want to be inaccurate, but the district attorney, no, the, I, I think it was the district attorney for the Portland area, which I think is Multnomah County, he said he's not going to prosecute those people, that, you know, what they're doing is um, social justice, and he's just not going to prosecute them, even though his job is, to enforce the laws of the state, he just said, no, we're not going to, we're not going to, sorry, we're not going to. So it's a crazy time we're living here in Oregon, but maybe it's the, uh, maybe it's the canary, you know, in the mine kind of thing. Maybe Oregon's maybe the, maybe one of the just first, uh, one of the first states that's going to legalize everything because they know it's coming. Maybe they know there's a real collapse 
uh, coming and, you know, they just want everybody to be stoned, drunk, and having sex so they don't see it coming. But anyway, um, along those lines, I wanted to bring up this, uh, the border crossing thing. Because, you know, of course, you know, now, you know, we're treating border crossers more humanely since Biden came into office. We're not putting them in cages anymore. We're putting them in, you know, I don't know what they call it now, but it's the exact same structure, but now it has a more pleasant name because the Democrats decided to rename it. It's the very, they didn't change the facilities at all. They just renamed it to make it more polite. But here's the problem. Uh, in uh, Amarillo, Amarillo, Texas, 37 people were were arrested for human trafficking, prostitution, and other crimes uh, right there in Amarillo. And that was just uh, March 11th. So it was just a couple days ago. And the problem is, you know, so if you say we're going to have open borders, this is what happens. People south of Mexico who want to come to the United States well, they get to Mexico, and there's people there, human traffickers, which will take advantage of those people financially, physically, emotionally, sexually, whatever, to get them to the southern border of the United States. Again, you know, do we respect those people or not? It's like putting lipstick on a pig. To me, I mean, seriously, to say you're going to open the borders and it sounds like, you know, oh, we're so fantastic. You know, we're just the greatest country on earth for all these people. We got to let them in. But but look what they're having to go through to get here. You know, and there and and those traffickers, <laughs> it's not like they have the greatest morals in the world. I mean, they're going to make money, number one. They're making all these people pay them to get them from wherever they are to the border and sometimes across the border uh, in the, the United States. But they're not treating them with respect and dignity and giving them, you know, uh, clean living conditions and everything else on the way. They're treating them horribly. And here... We think somehow by opening the borders that we're giving them some kind of uh, some kind of a better life. But yeah, maybe you know if they survive it, and uh, you know if you look at that accident that happened what two weeks ago when the the SUV got uh, ran into a truck full of gravel or something, and there was how many people in that freaking SUV? Like twenty seven people. I mean, even though it was an excursion, and my office manager has a, a big, beautiful Ford excursion with diesel engine. I just love hearing that thing suck gas. I am so proud of her for having that. But um, still, 27 people piled into that thing. Uh, it's, it's not good. It's not good for... Uh, you know, it's just not good. It's not safe. It's not pleasant. I mean, how do you get 27 people in a Ford excursion? I mean, look at it. What is it made for? 12? I don't know, 9 people maybe? And you pile 27 people in there? That's It's ridiculous. Okay. Well, I think that's about going to wrap it up for today. Holy cow. I have tons of stuff. <laughs> to talk about always and it's always a pleasure to be here i want to thank real liberty media for having me and uh, it's been a pleasure you guys have a great week i will see you next week thank you